Some of you are already married. Some of you are looking forward to getting married, perhaps, one day. So I remember as a young person, before I was married, that I was very interested in learning more about God's expectations in this area. So perhaps today you might learn some brand new things. Perhaps today everything you have heard will be repeated again today. I don't know. But I trust that it will be a blessing and a help to you. It is good for us to be reminded from time to time about God's expectations. It is good to go to a wedding from time to time. And when I go to a wedding, it reminds me of when I was getting married. And, and, and it is always an, an encouragement to be reminded of the awesomeness of that covenant that people make to each other when they get married. So Genesis chapter number 2, I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand to stand with me. Let's begin with verse number 19. It says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and held meat for him. Dear God, we thank you for your blessings of today. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Oh, precious Holy Spirit, we, we beg you again today that you will minister to our needs. You know exactly what we need. Help us, Lord. Encourage us where needed. Convict us where needed. Guide us where needed. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. So here we see that God created every animal that he ever created from the dust of the earth. And so it was with Adam himself. God created the first man from the dust of the earth. But interesting, interestingly enough, when he came to the woman, God did not create her from the dust. But instead, he took one of Adam's ribs, and from that rib, he created the woman. Look at verse number 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. I wonder why God did it that way. I wonder why he did not make her from the dust of the earth. You know, he doesn't explain himself why that was. Speculations abound about why he did it. But he took the woman from the side of the man. And when Adam looked at her, she told her, you're now bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And Adam, verse 23 says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And when a man and a woman come together to, to uh, consummate their marriage, in the eyes of God, that's exactly what happens. They become one together, one of, one of each other. In the eyes of God is one entity. That's why this entity of marriage is so solemn and so holy in the eyes of God. Verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That is God's intention for marriage, to be one flesh. Now, when somebody goes out, outside of the bounds of marriage, and they unite themselves with somebody else who is not their wife or husband, God is not well pleased with that union. Okay? He refers to it as immorality. 
uses the term sometimes fornication to refer to that union. And sadly, that happens a lot these days, that people that are not married, they come together with somebody else. Sometimes people that are married, they have a wife or a husband. Sometimes they wander off that union and they find somebody else to come together with. And once again, God is not well pleased when that happens. God is not going to bless that union. But instead, his wrath is upon those that, that enter into the relationship like that. The Bible refers to that union as adultery. And God is not well pleased when that's the case. Look at verse 25. And they, Adam and Eve, were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, that, of course, was talking about their physical, their physical, uh, they, they were not wearing clothes, per se. You know, speculation abounds about this also. Some people believe that they have some kind of, a, like, a, like a glow about them that hid that nakedness. And that glow may have disappeared or gone away when they sinned against God. That's just a speculation from men. But also, not only was, was that the case, physically speaking, but I believe that they were completely transparent one with the other. They, they were not hiding things from each other. They were completely honest. They were completely transparent. They were completely open one with another. And that, frankly, is also what God wants us to experience in marriage. He wants us as husbands and, and wives to be completely transparent, to be completely open with each other. Okay, and sometimes we don't like to do that because we become vulnerable. Because there might be things in our past or things that we might be involved with that that might cause us shame or remorse or whatever the case may be. But God wants us as husbands and wives to be completely honest, completely transparent one with the other. These people had it made. They had a perfect environment. Everything was provided for them. Of course, the serpent managed to create the feeling of discontentment in Eve. And she went out looking for something to fill that perceived need in her life. The devil tricked her. The devil is a great deceiver. And he's always trying to set up traps to snare us and to, and to captiv captivate us. But the woman, she, she listened to him. And, and she went ahead and disobeyed God's commandment that he had given her. Because of that, God passed a punishment for her and also for Adam. On verse number, chapter 3, verse number 16, I want to read this verse because it's going to help us understand something that we're going to read in Ephesians 5. But chapter 3 of Genesis, verse number 16 says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee he shall rule over thee God said now that was part of the punishment for the woman what that implies my friends is that before the fall there was a different kind of relationship between Adam and Eve. It was different before the fall. But after the fall, God said that the man shall rule over, over the woman. So that is, that is just not fair. Well, I didn't make the proclamation. I didn't pass the judgment. That was God's proclamation that he made. And of course, he passed the judgment against men. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, the earth today is 
diminishing. It's, it's getting worse. It, it, is, it is completely opposite to what the evolutionists will have us believe. The evolutionists will have us believe that things are getting better, that things are improving. Nonsense. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse <laughs> in this world. Okay? But again, when people refuse to, to acknowledge God, they, they believe a lie rather than believe the truth. So God says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto thus shalt thou return. So God passed judgment upon men also. Okay? He passed judgment upon men. He passed judgment upon, upon the woman. And of course, he passed judgment upon the serpent. And that is Satan himself. But now with this background in mind, I want us to go to the book of Ephesians. And that is my text for today. Ephesians chapter number 5. We have been going to the book of Ephesians now for several months. Ephesians chapter number 5. Let's begin with verse number... Let's begin with verse number 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, he was, he's addressing the believers at the church at Ephesus. Okay? And he's telling these believers that made up that body of that church, I want you to learn to submit one to the other. Okay? That's the kind of spirit that God wants us to have with each other. We're not to view ourselves as being Lord over other people. Okay? It's interesting when you study the life of Christ. Of course, Christ is God. Okay? God in the flesh. But when Christ was dwelling among us in this world, he did not go around from place to place with a huge entourage behind him trying to impart and circumstance. Because they are different people. That is not how he carried himself. But instead, he carried himself in a very meek and humble manner. He did. And he was God. You see, and that is the kind of attitude that he wants us to have as members of the church. Submitting one to another as believers, okay? One to another. We, we had that attitude. We had that demeanor about us. But then now he's going to jump from addressing the, the, the church as a whole, and now he's going to address a particular relationship, and that is the relationship between a wife and a husband. Okay, he's going to shift gears. And he says in verse 22, wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Do you know, do you realize that Jesus Christ himself, he submitted to the Father? If you remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was betrayed, he was praying to God, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup referring to the anguish, suffering, and death that he was about to experience. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He was praying to the Father. If it's possible, I don't want to go through that agony and death. But then he said this, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So he was willing to submit himself to the Father and do as the Father had said. You say, man, that doesn't make sense because they're, I mean, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're, they're so the same, they're, they're so equal to each other. 
How comes the one is submitting to the other? Well, that's the idea that he gave us a moment ago, right? When talking about the whole church, he says submit each other to one another. But well, now he's, he, you know, I, I, I'm giving you that example to let you know that this idea of submitting to another person does not mean that the person being submissive is of less value than the other. Yeah, I want to make that clear to you. Because Jesus Christ submitted to the Father, and Jesus Christ was the same as the Father. Okay? So this idea that because I submit to somebody, that means that I'm inferior, that is not the case at all. Let me give you another example. There'd be times in my life when I had a woman as my supervisor at work. with her being a woman. At that point, she was the authority over me. And I was to submit to her and follow her instructions and do as she would ask me to do. Okay? So this idea of submission has nothing to do with your gender per se. It has to do with the role that you play in certain areas of life. I am to submit myself to the authorities in this community. Okay, we have commissioners, we have police officers, and we have other authorities that are all around us to help us live in peace and tranquility. When that police officer comes to me and asks me to do something, I'm going to submit myself to that authority, whether he's a male or a female. It doesn't matter. He or she is the authority. And God expects me to submit to that authority. Well, here, when it comes to the area of the home, okay, the area of the home, God has these expectations in that particular realm. And he says to the wife, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. You say, how did that come to be? Well, it came to be because of what happened in the garden. Right? That's why I took you there earlier. It was part of the, the punishment of the curse to the woman. That, that her husband will have rule over her. You said, but I don't like that. Well, I, I don't like that I have to sweat and work hard. <laughs> and, you know, all these things are happening to the ground. You see, I, 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 let, me, let me just state this fact. Some people say, well, you know what? I can go and do whatever I want to do. And then come back to God and ask him to forgive me, and he will forgive me. Well, he will forgive you if you have the right attitude. If you have a contrite and broken heart, he will forgive you. But there's always a consequence to the sin that you commit. Right? There's always a consequence to what we do. If I go out today and I rob the bank and the police, and the police catch me, you know what's going to happen to me? I'm going to go to jail. If I repent and ask God to forgive me for that sin, he will forgive me. But the, the county is not going to release me because I, broke, because I broke the law. You see, and that's what happens. When we sin against God, yes, God will forgive us if we approach him in, in the right way and we ask him to forgive us. But God is not going to take away the consequences of the sin that we commit. There's always a price to pay for sin. And God passed this judgment upon the woman. He passed this judgment upon the, the man. He cursed the earth itself. He cast a curse upon Satan. All because of what happened in the garden. And now because of that situation happening way back then, God has certain expectations of the man and the woman. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. You see, my wife is not to submit to other husbands, or the other people that, that, that are married. She's to submit to me because I'm the one that she's married to. <laughs> she's not allowed to submit to everybody all around the, the place. She's to submit to, my, to me because I'm married to her. 
says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, it's very interesting what's going on here because God is using the relationship between the husband and the wife to explain the relationship between Jesus and the church. Okay, he's trying to use that as, a, as, a, as an example, if you will. So in the same way that Christ is the head of the church, and he is the head of the church, in the same manner, the husband is the head of the wife. Okay, that is, God's, that is God's expectation. One day I'm going to stand before God and God is going to judge me for the things that happened in my household. More so than my wife. Because he has, he took that responsibility upon me. So I'm going to have to give a higher you will have to give an account too as a mom. But when it comes to the whole unit, the family unit, I'm the, I'm the main authority and God is going to hold me responsible for that. I'm going to have to give an account for the things that I did or did not do in that realm. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, and we ought to be subject to Christ, we as the church cannot do whatever we want to do. We as the church have to be diligent in finding out what it is that God expects from us by reading and studying this book and then following through with what he says instead of we trying to do what we want. Okay? That's, that's the idea of submission. We are to follow his directives. We are to, to submit to what he's telling us to do. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything. Now, we do know that the devil is always trying to attack the family. You know that the family is the most important unit of any culture? The family is the most important unit in any culture. If I can manage to, to weaken the family, I will be able to weaken that community. I will be able to weaken that country. I will be able to weaken that church. If I can weaken the family. So guess what the devil always does? He's always attacking the family unit. And he's very, being very successful at it, isn't he? We're seeing a lot of families being destroyed all around us. A lot of chaos, a lot of anguish, a lot of pain. You know, I don't know if you're divorced here or not, but I'll tell you this, whenever a divorce takes place, Because like I told you a moment ago, when somebody gets married, God looks at that person as one unit. And when you try to split up that, there's going to be splinters all over. Both the husband and the wife, they're going to be, they, they, it's going to hurt. They're going to have some stuff to deal with because of that. But sadly, the children also go through a lot of suffering and anguish and pain. Whenever we do not follow God's perfect will, there's always, there's always a price to pay. It's just the way it is. Okay? And I'm not judging you if you have gotten divorced in the past. I, I'm not doing that. But what I'm telling you is this, that when that happens, it does result in a lot of issues, a lot of difficulties and problems that come about because of it. It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Then he addresses the husband. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So again, you know, he's using Christ and the church. He's comparing Christ and the church's relationship to the husband and the wife's relationship. Jesus Christ, he loved the church so much that he gave his very own life. So we as husbands ought to love our wives so much that we're willing to give our very own lives if it comes to that. Do not marry, man. Do not marry somebody that you're not willing to give your life for. That's a very high level of commitment. Do not marry to someone that you are not willing to give your very own life for. And then wives or ladies do not marry somebody that you are not willing to submit yourself to. It is a very basic, basic, basic test that you should ask yourself, can I submit myself to this guy? That's my husband. If, you, if your answer is no, then do not marry him. Look for somebody else that you're willing to submit to because that is what God expects. And then the same thing for the man. If you cannot picture yourself being willing to give your life for that young lady, then do not marry her. Until, you know, keep looking until you find the right person to marry to, that you have that strong commitment to. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You know, for centuries, we have referred to this union of marriage as holy matrimony. That's how it has been described through the centuries. This is a holy, it is a very holy thing to do, to enter into a marriage union. It's, it, you know, God looks at it as a very special thing. And we are to, to treat it as such. Do not treat it lightly. Okay? Those of you who have not married yet, you ought to think about this very seriously as you contemplate possibly having a mate in the future. Do not treat it, treat it lightly. It's a very serious thing to consider. You should, you should take it very, you know, you should pray seriously about it. You should ask for counsel for many people that you trust as, as you contemplate possibly marrying this individual. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Most people, <laughs> most people, they seek to take care of themselves, right? You, you want to, to take care of yourself. You don't want to put your hand on a fire. You don't want, you don't want to fall in a hole. You, you don't want to bring harm to yourself on purpose, typically. So we should have the same mindset when it comes to our relationship with our wives. Be careful. Treat her well. Don't abuse her. Don't mistreat her. Verbally or physically or in any other way. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's what God says. When you love your wife, you're nurturing your, that union of marriage. Okay? You're nurturing yourself. You're nurturing that, that wholeness, that oneness that marriage is. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherish it, even as the Lord, the church. That's, that's the, the attitude of God, Jesus, towards us, the church. He wants to cherish us. He wants to take care of us. And that's the same way with the husband towards his wife. A husband has to cherish his wife, to, to treat her well, 
to take care of her needs. That is God's expectation. Verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now he's referring to the church and Jesus, okay? We belong to him. He belongs to us. Okay? The husband and the wife, he belongs to her and she belongs to him. Okay, there's a oneness, that union that, that, that God wants in this relationship. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. And we read that way back in the book of Genesis, and I did not take time today, but Jesus Christ himself, he addressed this area of marriage in several occasions, and he also spoke about the permanence of marriage and how important it is. Now, look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay? Again, he was using the entity of marriage to help us understand the relationship between Christ and the church. In the same way that God, Jesus, relates to the church, that's the same way that the husband ought to relate to the wife and vice versa. In that same way. Verse 33 says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Do you know what a woman wants more than anything else is to be loved? That's what a woman wants, to be cherished, to be special, to be treasured. <coughs> That's what she wants, right? She wants that, that, that love. Now, do men have the same craving as, as her do towards love? No. They don't. You know what a man craves more than anything? Respect. <coughs> a man wants to be respected. The woman wants to be loved. And the man wants to be respected and reverence says, and the wife see that she reverence or respects her husband. There was a book that I read about, about this very topic. Love and respect. The woman craves that love and the man craves that respect. Doesn't mean that the man doesn't want to be loved. He wants to be loved too. But the biggest need that he has is for respect. So ladies, you ought to seek to show respect to your husband in little ways because that makes him feel special. And when you disrespect him, especially if you do so in public, that's a very embarrassing thing to go through. So show respect to your husband. And you husbands show love towards your wife. Give her that attention. Make her feel special. Like, 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 you, know, like, like you, you, you would even give your very own life for her. And if we as husbands and wives will have this, if we will follow God's model, and if we will follow God's prescription for marriage, a lot of things can be avoided from becoming big problems. Now, this is, the, this is the what happens when you marry somebody. You're going to marry somebody who is imperfect. Right? You are going to marry somebody who is imperfect. That means that they have flaws. That means that they have weaknesses. That even means that they might have nuances that might get under your skin <laughs> at times. <laughs> so knowing that, you have to realize, okay, the, you know, this person is imperfect, so, but so am I. I also have weaknesses. I also have flaws. I also may have nuances that might get under my wife's skin. So knowing those things, 
helps to understand, you know what, they are going to let me down. They are going to disappoint me. There are going to be things that I don't like at, at times and so on because that will happen in marriage. When you live very close with somebody, things will happen that you won't like. It's just the way it is. So you have to learn to be gracious. You have to learn to be understanding. You have to learn that you cannot make a big deal of everything. You have to learn to, again, just, just be gracious and forgiving and continually seek to improve and continually seek to give of yourself and invest of yourself to make this union one that is pleasing and honoring to God. And as you as husband and wife seek to commit yourself to doing these things, then God is going to bless. And your children will be blessed. And your family will be stronger. But on the other hand, if you choose to, to peek at each other for every little thing that don't go your way, and you make a big thing out of little things, and you're always attacking each other and belittling each other and finding ways to make the other one feel bad, then you're going to have a very difficult marriage. It's going to be a tough going. It's going to be a, a, a tough road to walk on. So we have to decide, am I going to live life in this realm in accordance to God's will? Or am, am, I, am I going to follow my own views? Am I going to follow what I want to do instead? And I guarantee you this. If you choose to do things your own way instead of God's way, then you're going to reap a harvest that's going to be bitter and not good.